So he hello, everybody. We are back with Richard Rowland for another Universal History uh, moment. And this time we're going to go a little more. A lot of people have been asking, when are you going to talk about American stuff, American history? Because I understand most of us are in North America. And so Richard proposed that we look a little bit at the symbolism behind Groundhog Day. This is Jonathan Pajot. Welcome to the Symbolic World. So we're recording this. It's January the 28th, the feast day of St. Ephraim the Syrian, by the way. Um, and uh, who we're not going to really talk about today, but it is his feast day. Uh, and if you watch this channel, then you probably you know St. Ephraim is important. Yeah, you know he's important. Um, so it's January the 28th. So this video will probably land sometime shortly after Groundhog Day, February the 2nd. Um, and I've been, this is a, a, a topic and a holiday that I've been fascinated by for a really long time. And so I thought this would be a fun way to talk about universal history. We are going to get back to talking about the grail a little bit more and maybe some other Arthurian stuff in future videos. Um, but I think that this is maybe an important thing to talk about because it shows a way that there is a remnant uh, you could say like a like a ruin of a very important aspect of medieval universal history still present in our culture today in kind of this goofy way. And and so I thought it would be kind of fun for people. And of I'm course, super it, excited because yeah. I know nothing about the origin of Groundhog yeah. Day. Like, well, I there's don't a, know anything there's a Bill Murray movie that is, of course, uh, pretty Classic. famous, which we will talk about a little bit because I think it's and this is not. Before we started recording, I said that some book was like the greatest book ever. And I was being a little facetious. This is not being a little facetious. I think that Groundhog Day with Bill Murray is one of the best movies ever made. Um, and I have I have reasons for that, which I'm not going to really necessarily get so much into today. But as we talk about the symbolism of Groundhog Day, you're going to be able to understand the Bill Murray movie maybe a lot better. So let's get to it. All right. So the media, the the the. So Groundhog tell them, because Europeans won't yes. know what Groundhog Day. You have to yes. start with that. Oh, man. but Europeans are supposed to know what Groundhog oh, Day okay. is. Oh, okay. But I, okay, yeah. all right, go for it. Okay, but let me, let me, I'll just explain what Groundhog Day is and how we observe it here in the US of A. Um, although they actually also do it in certain places in Canada mm -hmm. and certain places. It originally comes from Germany. Uh, so okay. it originally comes from Western Europe. And there's actually even a version of it in Ireland which is celebrated not on February the 2nd, but on February the 1st, which is the feast day of St. Bridget of Kildare. So here's what it looks like in the United States. Uh, there's this weird tradition, what appears to be like kind of like a weird folk tradition that nobody really remembers the origins of. And that is that um, on February the 2nd, for some arbitrary reason, on February the 2nd, a groundhog, uh, uh, in other words, a marmot. Um, this is it's like a it's like a really giant fat ground squirrel. Um, yeah. I don't know how it's to describe it. If you haven't seen one, just go Google that or something. Um, in fact, I was once staying in um, at the Ozark Heritage Center in in Arkansas. Um, we went there with our family, and they just had groundhogs everywhere, and they mm. were extremely friendly. But basically, it's like if you can imagine a squirrel without a tail or just like a tiny little yeah. tail that's as big as most dogs. They're yeah, lives little, underground. Yeah, they live underground, but they'll come out, especially like if they're used to people to come out and you can feed them and stuff. And they're it's it's scary though, because like- They're big. They're, they're big. big, yeah, they're big. Um, so, the, so the idea is, and this this is celebrated particularly at uh, one particular place in, in Pennsylvania. So we have this very famous groundhog, Pugsatani Phil, right? And so the, the, the myth or the kind of the, the folklore is that if the groundhog comes out of his hole, so the idea is he's been in hibernation for the last, you know, uh, six weeks or so for winter. So if he comes out of his hole and he sees his shadow, then he'll get scared by it, run back into his hole and go back into another six weeks of hibernation. And that's how you know that there's going to be six more weeks of winter. Mm. If he comes out of his hole and he doesn't see his shadow, then it's supposed to be an early spring that year. 
And so that's the folklore. And of course, in practice, there's always, he always sees his shadow. There's always six more weeks of winter because basically we're materialists. And so we make the groundhog conform to when we say winter is over rather than making winter being over conform to when the groundhog says it's going to be over. Right. So he always sees his shadow. Basically. He always sees his shadow. Yeah. And so that's the thing. And uh, in the United States, there, there will always be like a little news story on February the 2nd, Mm -hmm. affirming whether or not Puxitani Phil sees his shadow. Right. And then has to go back in the hole. So there's a really famous uh, Bill Murray movie, which you mentioned uh, that was made kind of based around this concept. And so in this case, you have this guy, um, uh, a, a, a newscaster, a reporter named Phil, played by Bill Murray. Um, and he's he's kind of like most of Bill Murray's characters, right? Uh, you know, very kind of world-weary, very acerbic, um, kind of actually an awful person. Uh, yeah. But because he's, you know, but, but always with this sort of brilliance where they don't tell you he's an awful person. They just let you pick it up in all these little ways. And you start to realize, man, this guy's pretty terrible, right? Um, and basically, but funny because he's terrible. But funny because he's terrible, right? And so basically, this this character, this newscaster, Phil, he uh, he goes to sleep. Uh, so so he he has to go out and and, and it's and on Groundhog Day. On Groundhog Day, he has to go out on Groundhog Day and do this fake, you know, do this fake news story about the groundhog seeing his shadow. And it's it's stupid. It's made up. He hates it. He's really upset about it. He treats all of the people like his producer and his camera guy and treats them all really terribly. And then wakes up the next morning and finds out that he has to repeat the entire day. And he has to repeat the entire day over and over and over again um, until basically he gets it right. And in this case, getting it right means he learns to be uh, a much more selfless individual and he learns to, um, and then he, and he, and then he wins. Learns the to love. love too. He, he wins learns. this. Yeah. Well, he learns to. Hey, this is important. It's very important. It's very important. Sounds tacky, he, but it's very important. Yeah. 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 It sounds. It sounds like it's corny or something like that, but it's it's really important to understanding the story. Um, is that he learns to uh, love and and then be loved by this this woman in his life who had been treating pretty badly up to that point. So anyway, that's a, it's a great uh, fun movie, um, and most people have probably seen it. Um, yeah. And if not, like if you're you just like real it. young and you didn't grow up watching that movie, then you should go watch it because I think you'd be surprised how how good it is. So I want to talk about why is this a thing? Like of all the most arbitrary things, like I used to joke that February like just really got the short end of the stick as months for as months go because it already has fewer days, and then it just has like a bunch of seemingly arbitrary made up stuff going on in it, like Groundhog Day. It's like what's what's this about? Well, Groundhog Day is actually the one remaining remnant within American popular culture of actually a very important holy day in the history of Western Europe and the history of Eastern Europe as well, just within the Christian tradition. Um, And that's a feast day in the Orthodox Church. We call it the meeting of the Lord in the temple in uh, the Western tradition. It's sometimes referred to as the purification of the Blessed Virgin Mary, um, or um, more colloquially in the old English tradition, it's called Candlemas, right? The reason it's called Candlemas is because this is the day in the Christian tradition when you traditionally, uh, uh, you get a whole bunch of candles. You either make them or you buy them, and then you bring them to the church, and you bring them to the church. Uh, for a couple of reasons. One is to give them in the Middle Ages, you would you would give. Um, so they actually had these these groups of lay people that would come together in a guild. They were called candlemas guilds. And what they would do is they would either make or buy a lot of really, really big candles. And then every year on candlemas, they would donate the majority of these candles to the parish. Um, and it was how the parish, I mean, candles were pretty expensive in the Middle Ages, illumination. Sometimes they were called illumination guilds. Um, like illuminating things, especially uh, most importantly, illuminating the host at the at the moment of the elevation, so that people could see it. Um, especially if it's kind of dark outside, there's no electric lighting, things like this. This is a this is a really important function. So it was a way for lay people to serve the community. 
Um, they would give the candles so that the church would have candles for the year, basically. Right, right. But then also they would get their own candles blessed. And so mm-hmm. the so the you'd get a holy candle and you could take this holy candle home. And if there was sickness in the house or there were other reasons to suspect demonic activity. And I don't say that at all cynically. Um, in fact, I have, hold on. I still have a handful of my own holy candles left over from last last year. So if there's sickness in the house or some other like hint of demonic activity, you light the holy candle to drive out the darkness and to drive out uh, the demonic influences. Um, so, so that's why it's very often referred to as, as candlemas. So the event that this feast celebrates in the life of Christ is, of course, Mary and Joseph coming to the temple, bringing, um, bringing the Christ child, presenting an offering of two young turtle doves. And as they're doing this, they're met by these two figures who kind of pre- represent the, you could say, like the last of the old guard mm-hmm. of the righteous remnant of the Old Testament. So one of them is the elder Simeon. And there's this whole tradition about the elder, uh, the elder Simeon that he's actually several hundred years old. Mm. It doesn't say this in the Bible. What it says in the Bible is that he is, uh, that the Lord had promised him that he would, he was, it just says he's of a great age, of a great age. And that the Lord had promised him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Christ until he'd seen the Messiah. But there's a tradition about him that says that he's extremely old um, you know, several, several hundred years old. And that in fact, he's one of the original translators of the Septuagint. Oh, interesting. Um, so there's this, um, maybe the best way to understand that is simply to say that he's got this explicit tie to the old Testament, right? So that he's, he's one of those 70 elders mm. right, who translated the Septuagint into Greek. So he's, he's got this explicit tie to the old Testament. So he's, he's, um, you could say like the last guard, uh, uh, the the last, you know, I know that technically speaking, like John the Baptist is sort of the last Old Testament prophet, right? But you could see Simeon as as also kind of filling that role to a certain extent, right? He's the he's the archetypical last elder of Israel, right? Yeah. That the at this point in time, the faithful people of God in Israel have been, you know, it's just a very few, it's a very small remnant. And of that small remnant, Simeon is kind of, you know, the type of all of them. Yeah. And he also, if he's a tr- uh, translator of the Septuagint, that he also represents something like the last breath of the Old, yes. old Testament. Yes. And that will be illuminated by the candle, right? Will be illuminated yeah. by Christ and will be revealed, like, it'll be revealed for what it is or for what its purpose is. Yeah. So that there's that. Um, and of course, what does he pray? He says, mine eyes have seen your salvation, right? A light to be revealed to the Gentiles yeah. and the glory of your people, Israel. So mm. the idea is that you have something that was the light, was the glory of Israel, which could be the Torah, right? Could be the, the law, the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures. And then it's revealed to the Gentiles, revealed to the nations. Sometimes it's translated, but it's really Gentiles, right? Mm. Um, the light dawning on the Gentiles, right? And so it's this... Uh, this this light moving out of a place of darkness and obscurity into kind of a more open place, right? And attached to this, there is the symbolism of of uh, attached to this is the prophecy which Saint Simeon makes about uh, to the mother of God about her own sorrow at the foot of the cross. Hmm. He says that this this you know child has has been you know brought into this space, brought into the world for the rising and falling of many in Israel. And for a sign that will be spoken against. Of course, the sign that will be spoken against is the crucifixion. Um, and then he says, but a sword will pierce your own heart also. Right. And so he's talking about the sword piercing the heart of the mother of God at the moment of the crucifixion, her anguish. And this is like the, the predominant perspective that we get in Orthodox Holy Week um, is mostly from the, the perspective of the mother of God watching her son in the lead up to the passion, watching her son on the cross. Yeah. Um, and so all of this is, is under, is really important to understand what's going on in this holiday. And I swear it is in fact connected to Groundhog Day. Um, <laughs> well, for sure. Like already yeah. It, yeah. you can see the idea of, of the perpetual, if you think understand theophany 
Because often we we think of theophany as the baptism of Christ, but right, right. theophany in its more original symbolism had to do with light. It had to yes. do with the revelation of the divine logos, of the light shining onto the world, which made sense after the birth of Christ, which is the the solstice at the at the darkest day, where this, the the sun is hidden, where the the light is still looks like it's going down. You don't know yet that it's coming back, but it's actually. It's moving up, you know, right? It's it's moving into its revelation. And so to think of, of theophany, epiphany, as the first glimmers of that light yeah. and the beginning of the showing of, of what has happened, you know, on Christmas morning, moving in now to to the the to Simeon recognizing and saying, now the light, he even uses the image of the light, which will be a sign. So I mean it's very powerful. Yeah. So we'll come back to the the light and the darkness here in just a second, because that's really important to this. I do want to point out, though, that there's also this particular feast has these this really explicit. Um, if you look at the iconography for this feast, it's very explicitly tied up with the idea of the temple, of the sanctuary, of the holy place and of the reception of the Eucharist. And so if you look at a, an icon of the feast, what you'll typically see is the mother of God handing the Christ child to Simeon, but Simeon has his hands covered with his, with his robe, right? And if you look at something like an icon of the communion of the apostles or something like that, you'll see the same kind of thing in, a, in an icon. You never see people taking communion with their bare hands, right? They've always got their hands covered with usually with like their outer garment or their, or their robe or something like that to receive the Eucharist, right? Um, and then behind them, uh, in the icons of this feast behind them, there's always this very curious looking structure. It's got four pillars mm -hmm. and then a dome, usually a dome or kind of a roof over the top of those pillars. And then very often there's a curtain that can be drawn around them. Yeah. And um, so in the tabernacle of Moses, right, obviously the whole thing is a tent. But then when Solomon builds his temple in the temple of Solomon, there was this um, there was this pillared. Uh, uh, a pillared curtain, right? Uh, so, like a tent inside of the temple, basically enclosing the 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 holy of holies, right? The place where the ark of God was supposed to rest. And in the ark, you're supposed to have the, you know, obviously you're supposed to have the the tables of the law and the ten commandments, and, or the the tables of the law and the and the, the the manna and so on, right? Well, obviously, as we've talked about in this series, at some point the ark went missing. Right. And so at some point, these things are missing from the holy place, the most holy mm. place in, in the temple. And they're certainly not present in the second temple, right? By the time of Christ, right? There's yeah. no ark in the temple, which is why the 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 parallel feast to this feast, um, you could say like the four feasts together have a I'm gonna try to do a piece on this for the symbolic world block. So maybe cool. Uh, it's already written. I just need to like finish it up, but um in the winter feast of the church, you have this like chiastic structure where you have like starting with the entrance of, I keep hitting my microphone, starting with the entrance of the Theotokos in the temple and then going to Christmas and Theophany or Epiphany and then finishing right at the, the presentation of the Lord in the temple. Right. Nice. Yeah. 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 So it's really, it's a really nice structure. Um, and so at the, the, the parallel feast to this one, the entrance of the Theotokos in the temple, that's a big deal because it's the first time the ark has actually come to the second temple. But anyway, that's a different, different video different discussion. yeah and so so now you have like the glory descending on right the earth, basically like one of the that type of imagery yeah thing. so this structure this four pillar structure with the dome on top this is a chiborum and as you know yeah. in early christian architecture uh when christians started being able to build their own church buildings before uh the iconostas really develops right um before that really existed what you had was this chiborum this is this canopy with a curtain that could be closed at certain points during the liturgy over the holy table, right? Which, by the way, the Chiborum, you can see it still. If you look at images of the communion of the apostles, mm -hmm. usually Christ is under a Chiborum. <laughs> and the, the, in the Ethiopian church, it's they still, most of their altars have a Chiborum. Like the, the ones that I've seen, they, they still use that structure. Coptic churches still use that often as well. And there is a, there's even a little bit of a tendency now in, in the modern Orthodox churches to reintroduce it into the practice. I saw a Chiborum. There's one, there's one even 
in in uh, in South Carolina at the mm-hmm. at a Greek church that I went to where I saw there's it. some there are some very old Greek churches like in Greece that still have them, and even some very old Western churches in like the Netherlands that still have them. Really so, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, so when you see a chiborum in an icon, right? Which, as you just pointed out, anytime someone is being given communion in an icon, there's always a chiborum in there somewhere, right? So this is a way it's doing two things. One is it's it's this explicit tie from the Jewish temple to the Christian temple, right? Yeah. But then also it's this, it's a sort of a shorthand to tell you something Eucharistic is, is happening mm-hmm. and kind of the meaning of this feast, right? And so you have, um, and so you have Simeon here standing in front of the Chiborum. And even you, a lot of times on the, on the altar under the Chiborum, you'll see a gospel book, which is of course mm-hmm. an anachronism from a, like a, a purely like boring sense of understanding things, right? Uh, but for us, we, we see it as a fulfillment. What's supposed to be in the most holy place that isn't is the tables of the law, right? But the tables of the law in the Christian church are replaced by, we don't have a Torah scroll in the altar. We have, we have the gospels, right? Mm. So there's this, you know, kind of all this, all this great symbolism, which again is, is part of that thing of like the, the hidden glory of Israel now becoming the light for the Gentiles. Right. And so, uh, and so you've got Simeon in the attitude of someone receiving communion, standing behind in front of this structure, which is all about the reception of the Eucharist, all about communion. Right. And he's receiving the Christ child. And if you look at, um, if you look at the hymns of the Orthodox Church around this feast, like, like the Festal Meneon, um, the they they talk about this idea of of the use the Eucharistic symbolism that's going on here. It's really explicit in the hymns, but then they also tie it back to another meeting of the Lord in the temple, right? Which is in Isaiah chapter six. Mm-hmm. So in Isaiah chapter six, you have a prophet who goes to the temple and he meets with God. And in this story, what you have is a prophet who's waiting at the temple because God isn't there, but then God shows up to the temple, right? And so Mm -hmm. it's kind of this inversion of the Isaiah 6 story. And and so there's one of the hymns. I wish that I had uh, had the Festival Menean over here. I think it's over on the shelf. But one of the hymns says something like, the seraphim who is Mary, right? So in that that story in Isaiah chapter 6, right? Isaiah has this vision of God and he sees him and he says, woe is me. I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. I live in the midst of the people of unclean lips for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Right. And so a seraphim takes one of the, uh, takes a pair of tongs, yeah. takes one of the coals from off the, the heavenly altar and comes and touches it to his lips. And when he touches it to his lips, he says, see, this is, you know, your, your sin is taken away. Your lip, you, you've been purged, you've been cleansed. Right. Um, and so what the, and so the, the the hymns around this feast in the Meneon, they they take that symbolism and it, it talks about the seraphim who is Mary brings the burning coal that is mm. the Christ child, nice. right? And gives it to the prophet Simeon, right? And at that point, he's able to say, now let your servant depart in peace. In other words, I'm ready to die now. And in the Middle Ages, this is very closely uh, associated with the idea uh this might seem weird to us now, except for those of us, you know, who are maybe more traditional Christians, but even then, like if you're a convert, it's hard to think about things this way. But in the middle ages, one of the main things that people prayed for, almost the only thing that people prayed for, if you were very poor, was that you would, you would have enough anticipation of your death that you would be able to make one final confession and receive communion before you died. Right. Mm -hmm. They called it like your, uh, your, um, they would refer to it as like, as like your traveling money. In other words, like that, that you would be able to receive the Eucharist one last time before you make the journey right mm. to the, to the next life. And, um, and so they saw Candlemas as being like sort of an example of this, that he receives Christ one last time mm. before he crosses, you know, the river into death. You yeah. know? And so, um, so there's, there's uh, a bunch of really cool, beautiful Eucharistic symbolism in here. And of course in the Orthodox church, uh, when priests take communion, right? When they give themselves or w- when they take communion, they say, see, this has touched my lips, my sins mm. purged, right? Yeah, so yeah, they yeah. say those words Ooh. from Isaiah when they receive communion. So oh, there's this really yeah. beautiful, like kind of triangulation between the feast of the meeting of the Lord in the temple and the meeting of the Lord in Isaiah chapter six, and then the, um, and then the reception of communion in the, in the, in the ancient church. 
Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to point all that stuff out because it really helps us understand the symbolism of this feast and kind of what this feast is about, right? This feast, it's about illumination. It's about fire. It's about, um, it's about the, the hidden glory, right? Kind of being, I mean, it's about lights. Yeah. Like right. it, it's about light. It's really about, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it is definitely about, yeah. about the, the light manifesting itself more and yeah. more. But it's not just about light manifesting itself because it, it's always light that comes with, uh, um, because there's also an as an element of it that is actually about a prediction of darkness, mm. right? Cause, cause of Rasimian, right. He has this beautiful moment of light. And then he says, he's going to be a sign that is spoken against. He's talking about the passion. Yeah. And he says, a sword is going to pierce your own heart also. So it's, it's this, um, it's this, it's a, it's also the promise of darkness It's the promise of a wound, but ultimately it's the promise of Pascha, right. Mm -hmm. Which is, which is the, preeminent Christian festival of light breaking yeah. into the world, right? Coming out of the darkness. So why February the 2nd, right? Well, obviously February the 2nd is 40 days after December the 25th. So it's, yeah. it's 40 days after Christmas. Um, and so it's the 40 days of the Virgin Mary's purification. However, February the 2nd. I mean, is, you people don't know anything about this. Like you have to just say, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. That, that women would have to would have to purify themselves at a, after a certain amount of time. Right. That they, they they had to do that regarding their menstruation, but they also had to do it right. regarding after giving yeah. birth to a child. So, according to the law of Moses, forty days after giving birth to the to a child, women were supposed to present themselves at the the temple of God or the tabernacle, of the temple of God, and bring an offering for their purification. Um, either you know, uh, like a young lamb, or if you were if you're poor, then you could bring like two turtle doves or two young pigeons. I think, I think I've read uh, from one historian that like at the time of Christ, people only ever brought the, the two birds, the but anyway. Um, and so uh, you're supposed to bring a, an offering and it's basically, uh, you could say it's a, I don't know, we probably don't want to get in this too, too much, but you could just say like in the Old Testament and the Mosaic law, there are certain things that bring you very close to life like this, like the beginning of life or very close to death. And it's like, those things are too holy. And so if you were exposed to them, or if you participate in them in some way, then there has to be this reintegration of you into kind of the normal liturgical community, like the normal community of the people of Israel. Yeah. Right. And so that's what this is about, right? Birth being extremely close to like the beginning of life, but also very close to to, to death. death yeah yeah like both of those things at the same time um and so a woman at the end of and we still do this in the orthodox church today we there there's you know the ceremony of churching for uh, a woman and her child which we're going to be doing um here in just a couple of weeks nice because right? uh, we just yeah. had a just had a baby a few weeks congratulations ago. yeah congratulations. thank you thank you yeah and so um so all of this uh, all of, and and again, like you can even understand that purification, right? It's something that's that's hidden. So, like a woman after she has a child, she's supposed to be hidden, sequestered from the community of the people of God, right? Almost because she's like she's like too special. She's like too holy. She can't she can't yet integrate into the into the life of the community, right? And then at the end of that time, that hidden glory is now revealed into like a more public kind of a light. Yeah. Um. However, the traditional date for Good Friday is, of course, March the 25th, which at one point in time was the spring equinox. I know that the solstices and equinoxes, they move around a little bit. But at one particular point in time, that was the, the traditional date of both Good Friday and the Annunciation, right, is March the 25th. Mm -hmm. um, lots of people out there might want to, like, argue about this stuff. Um, all I can say is I don't care. Um, <laughs> I don't care. Yeah. Um, this is the, this is, these are the traditional dates. Um, yeah. that's all that needs to be said about it. So what you have to realize is that this situates the meeting of the Lord, which is 40 days after, you know, this situates the meeting of the Lord or Candlemas as being halfway between the winter solstice and the spring equinox. Nice. Yeah. So to me, this is, this, this sort of reveals or sort of brings out one of the most important facets of universal history. Okay. And this is why this is justly a universal history video, not just Richard talking about, you know, feasts that he likes, right. And Groundhog Day. And Groundhog Day. 
Um, because one of the most important elements of universal history uh, is the way that the is understanding the way that the Christian story maps onto and it fulfills the sort of old agricultural cycle of the year, which is present. It's not just pagan; it's present in both paganism and Judaism. Mm. Both paganism and Judaism have this old this agricultural cycle that, by the way, predates the law of Moses when. When God starts telling the children of Israel, here are the feasts of the agricultural cycle, that wasn't the first time that they'd ever heard of them or celebrated them, yeah. right? He's just telling them, here's how you celebrate these in a way that shows that you're my people, right? Mm -hmm. um, but everyone basically has these feasts and more or less with certain variations, pretty much every culture in the world that lives within the same kind of climate and climate cycle has the feast right around the same points in time, okay? So what universal history does, you know, one thing that we've talked about is the way that universal history shows how a group of people try to tie themselves into the Christian and the Roman story, yeah. right? But another thing that universal history does that's kind of part of this in this broader, expansive way that I'm using the term is it shows how, how, how does my daily life tie into that story? Mm -hmm. And so... In so sometimes people will make a big deal about the fact that, for instance, in um, in like Celtic paganism, they had these sort of quarters of the year, and these were the days that fell exactly between the each solstice and equinox. Right. right. So there's one on this date, right? Um, in in Ireland, the, it was celebrated on uh, February the first, which happens to also be the feast day of Saint Bridget of Kildare, who's actually the the patron saint of my new daughter. So there you go. Um, it's all connected. Oh, connected. Um, but, uh, and so people will make a big deal about this and, and they'll be like, oh, this is just like, see, it's just a Christianizing of this older pagan thing. And again, to that, I have to say, one, I don't care. Like don't you guys can be complaining. We'll, we'll, we'll baptize shark week. Like, I'm sure you've seen that meme. It's like, listen, if, <laughs> if you guys keep, if you guys keep complaining about this stuff, we're going to make shark week a Christian holiday. Like that's right. Have to deal with it. Uh, but, but I mean, uh, in another sense, you have to realize that this is the this is the way that things work, right? This is the way that that we we that reality manifests, and this is the way that we know each other and the world that we live in, and it's the way that we know God, right? Mm. Is the way that these things manifest themselves in time and the cycles, the recurring cycles of the seasons, which were made by God, right? And so it's kind of like preposterous to think, and this is why I, I just I get heartburn from these people who are like, oh, well, this, you know, um, a long time ago when I was a pastor of a church, there was a big fracas because we we had a Christmas tree up in like the the foyer, the foyer, you know, which is what Baptists call the narthex, you know. Yeah. And uh, and uh, some people are like, oh, well, it, and, you know, like Chris, you know, that's a pagan holiday. And they sent me like this DVD series, you know, like you know you gotta take yeah, the christmas tree exactly it's a pagan holiday, mean, right I know, I know you know what i'm talking about right but the reason that stuff gives me heartburn is is because it's like you know you think god doesn't own the days of the year like he made the year he made yeah. the agricultural cycle he made the solstices and the equinox you know like he made these things and so why would he not when he manifests himself in the world right when when he becomes incarnate he becomes incarnate taking on human nature in this full, complete, total way. But he also like becomes incarnate at a particular point in time, at a particular place in history. But what the, what the whole sort of Christian year shows is the way in which that particularity, you could say again, like the, the glory of the people Israel becomes a light to the nations, right? Mm -hmm. and, so, and so Christ doesn't just fill up the 33 years that he's walking around on planet earth, yeah. but actually fills up all of time with himself. Right. So there's no other way that this stuff could manifest, right? This is a feature. It's not a bug. Exactly. Right? Um, <clears throat> in understanding the relationship of the times of the year uh, to the life of Christ via the Christian liturgical year is vital. It's absolutely vital to the reading of medieval literature. Uh, just, to take as a, for instance, Arthurian literature, every great Arthurian story happens at a particular Christian feast day. 
Yeah. Sometimes it's Pentecost. Sometimes it's Christmas. Sir Gowan and the Green Knight happens on the feast, not of Christmas, one of my many, I mean, it happens during Christmas tide, but doesn't happen on Christmas Day, which is one of my many beefs with a recent film. Yeah. It happens on the Feast of the Circumcision of the Lord, which was very popular in England at the time that that poem was written. Yeah, and also it's like, don't you, if you cut something, a, a, a monster in two, and you don't understand that there's a relationship between the circumcision and that, yeah. and that it's like you're missing out on some of the story of what's I, going on. And I on don't want to, I don't want to like, I don't want to sound impious about this. Okay. But first of all, you have to understand in the middle ages, people thought this was a pretty good joke, right? There's a beheading it happens on the feast of the circumcision of the Lord. Like, like people, people were aware. Right. But also like, if you don't understand, if you don't understand that that story begins on the feast of the circumcision, you won't actually understand anything about the story. Yeah. Right. Which is like what to do with the remainder. Right? Exactly. That's, that's what the whole story is about. That's what the whole story is about. I mean, it's about, you know, like the sash and yes. everything is always yes. about, it's always yes. about that. It's like, yeah. Anyways. And so, and so, uh, yeah. And so if you don't understand this stuff, then you won't be able to read medieval literature. Right. Um, and, and kind of know what it's about. So to me, like, if you want to understand something like medieval universal history, one of the most important things you need to do is say, well, how did how did a certain group of people, how did they celebrate this feast? What did they do for Christmas? What did they do for Easter? What did they do for, um, if you want to understand like who they really were and what they thought about themselves, it's not just how did they write themselves into the larger narrative on this really meta cultural level, but how did they see themselves being as being a part of that story in their day-to-day -day life? For mm -hmm. instance, Candlemas in England, huge deal, huge deal. And in fact, if you were, if you were, if you lived in a town that was large enough uh, to do this, um, uh, most Candlemas, Candlemas celebrations were celebrated by a sort of mystery play slash procession before mass. Mm -hmm. and so you'd get one of the women of the town to dress up like the Virgin Mary, um, which of course for them meant you should dress her as beautifully as you could afford to do, right? Because um, they, they weren't interested in the fact that, okay, yes, obviously Mary and Joseph were quite poor. You know, for them, it was, it was, you know, this is, they're trying to show her as, as who she is, right? She's the queen mm -hmm. of heaven. She's the mother of God, right? So we want to, we want to show that in the way that we dress her. So they would dress, dress her up. You'd have an older man in the, in the town playing Joseph. Uh, she would be carrying like a little doll, right? And then you'd have a whole procession, right? A whole procession uh, with everyone bringing, again, bearing candles. Everybody would light their candles and they bear them together in this big procession to the, parish church and then they'd have like an older man meet you at the door of the parish church and you'd come in and what would you do you'd celebrate mass mm. um and of course receive the eucharist right so there's this whole you know there there was like this very you know it was very festal there are whole carols like we know about christmas carols right but there actually used to be carols for everything and christmas carols are the only things that have really survived because christmas for most people like living in the West, most evangelicals is kind of the last surviving vestige of the Christian year. Like even more so than Easter. Yeah. Um, you're right. Yeah. Even more so than Easter. Like I know that, you know, at the churches where I served, Christmas is a much bigger deal than Easter. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and that's when, you know, even a Baptist church, like they'll break out the nativity scene. They'll put some graven images right up there in front of the pulpit for everyone to look at for the entire month of December. You know, it's, it's kind of, but it's just like when Christmas hits, that's when our nostalgia really kicks in mm. for, for not just for like, how did my family celebrate, but also like a wider cultural nostalgia kind of kicks in and we do things and we sing these really old songs. Those are the oldest hymns in any given Protestant hymnal are always going to be your Christmas carols, mm. right? That go back, you know, as early as the 15th, 16th century, right? Before the Reformation, right? Mm. Um and it's just like when we hit Christmas, a certain nostalgia kicks in. But there used to be carols for everything. And there are beautiful, interesting, fascinating carols. Even some Candlemas written, carols. Candlemas carols. Even some written by Puritans in uh, like colonial Williamsburg. Wow. Um, uh, in fact, um, can I just read you a couple? Is that okay? Do we have time? Sure, it's yeah, up to yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. All right. So um, uh one thing that to know about Candlemas, so this is like a, a little kind of a superstition 
around Candlemas is that Candlemas is actually when you're supposed to take your Christmas decorations down. Right. So you put them up on Christmas Eve. You take them down on Candlemas. Um, I thought I you put, we, put, we took them down on Epiphany. Yeah. Really? Well, let me just read you. This little, <laughs> All right. This there's, a, there's a little bit of a conflict there. So. All right. So this one, this one is a, a poem from Colonial Williamsburg. Okay. When New Year's Day is past and gone, Christmas is with some people done. So some people stop celebrating Christmas on New Year's Day. Right. But further, some will it extend. And at 12th day, their Christmas end, which is what there you, you go. That's me. Yes. yes. At candle and some people stretch it further yet at Candlemas, they finish it. The oh. gentry carry it further still and finish it just when they will. They keep good wine and eat good cheer and keep their Christmas all the year. There you so, go. So some people... Some people are always partying, right? And I do have neighbors who keep their Christmas lights up just all year long. Um, and I don't know what's going on there, but they seem like- But well, we tend to keep the Christmas lights outside. People tend to keep them at, toward the, until the end of- Of, uh, of winter, winter. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But the inside, I, the, the inside decorations go down. At yeah. Christmas lights like aren't quite the, like, they're not quite as good as a holy candle. But in our in our modern age, they're pretty darn close. They're pretty close. That's um, right. They're pretty close. Yeah, I'm a big fan of like oh, please life. just like make your yards go crazy on Christmas. I think that's great. So this, uh, I'll, but I'll read this other one. This is right, okay. um, this real quick. This is like a this is like a late 1500s. This is a Candlemas Carol. Um, it's called Down with the Rosemary and So, and you can find like people singing it on YouTube, but it goes like this Down with the Rosemary and So, Down with the Bays and Mistletoe, Down with the Holly, Ivy, all wherewith you dressed the Christmas hall, so that the superstitious find no one least branch there left behind. For look how many leaves there be neglected there, maids, trust to me, so many goblins you shall see. So it's like, it's like hmm. for, for every like. For every like leaf of Christmas decoration you leave out, you're gonna have after, that many goblins. After Candlemas, that many demons, you have after Candlemas, right? So, uh, yeah. So it's so it's it's uh, and and that's kind of like a, a silly little rhyme, but you can again see there's something about the day going back to Simeon's prophecy, right? It's this revelation of light, but it's also there's some kind of a uh, prediction of the monstrous of something something that's going to happen. Right? Mm. So. Um, all of this is, I think, pretty important to understanding. Uh, so where where did we get Groundhog Day from? All right, let's go right. from Groundhog Day now. So Groundhog Day um, in, uh, in various places in Europe, this day, February the 2nd, um, probably because of some, well, for all the reasons that we just talked about, right? You're halfway between the winter solstice and the spring equinox, right? All this stuff became a day of what you could call what's sometimes called weather lore or weathermancy, right? So it's basically like trying to predict the weather. How good of a spring, like how, how good of a spring are we going to have? When can we start yeah. planting? Like all this different stuff, right? It's all tied up, tied up in this stuff. And um, and so what happened is that in pretty much all Western uh, European traditions, they started using the weather on Candlemas Day, which again hits at this midpoint, but is significant for these other spiritual reasons. And for them, like in the Middle Ages, if you were like, well, there's like a, a meteorological reason and then a spiritual reason. And like, if you tried to tell somebody in the Middle Ages that those were just like separate things that didn't have anything to do with each other, yeah. nobody would... They'd, they'd look at you like you're a crazy person, right? And they'd be right. Yeah, they'd be right. So they use the, the Candlemas weather to predict the beginning of spring. And usually in Germany, the the, the animal in question was actually a badger. Um, and so, in fact, in Nova Scotia, yep. um, which is up in Canada, or so I'm told, um, uh, it's called Dox Day with docks being like the 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 german word for a badger yeah right? okay so not not groundhog day but dox day um uh, sometimes also though it's a fox or a bear for our purposes it can basically be any hibernating animal like anything that goes to sleep in the winter and then wakes up in the spring interesting for the bear how would they get the bear to come out of <laughs> during hibernation sounds a little trickier well that's what they tended to use badgers All right, um yeah. <laughs> um a, a, an angry badger is still uh, a handful, let's say, it's, but not 
not quite to the level that an angry bear is. Right? That's right. Grumpy, angry. Right. Bear. So when the Pennsylvania Dutch, when they, uh, they're, these are like basically immigrants from German speaking areas of Europe, mm. and they migrated to this part of Pennsylvania where there were no badgers. But what did they have that hibernated in the winter? Groundhogs. Right. Marmots. Right. And so that's kind of the, that's kind of the, um, that's kind of the origin of that. So basically what you have is there's this obscure weather lore practice that is, well, it's not obscure, it's like pretty widely practiced, but it's on the fringe of the thing that the feast is about. Yeah. And in the United States, we've totally forgotten the feast, mm. right? We've totally forgotten the feast. But everyone remembers the little minor weather lore practice yeah. that's associated like halloween you know it's right. the same as the, right. the, the, how americans celebrate their holidays right. christmas too right pretty- yeah like we take we take the fringe thing and the grift the gift giving that's yeah. the, that's the feast right. you take the the monsters coming out that's the feast and now the right now the the, the badgers yeah. the light yeah and so we take the we take the thing that's sort of like the fringe part of the celebration of the holiday which there's nothing wrong with that no. in yeah. its place it's fine but then that's the, the we we take that thing we put it in the center it becomes the most essential thing right mm. um but i do want to talk <clears throat> real quick now now that we kind of understand like the background and kind of this you know the the spiritual and the medieval map of of this feast to talk about what it means for the groundhog to see its shadow and to go back into hibernation mm. right so the whole idea of seeing its shadow is that it's clear and sunny on the day, right? You're in the middle of winter right now, right? So six weeks into winter, you got six more weeks of winter coming. So if it's the middle of winter, and in this particular climate, like Northern European climate, and it's bright and sunny and kind of a warm day, Mm. such that this animal, which is coming out of death, right? It's coming out of sleep, it's coming out of the earth, comes up out of death, it sees the light, but you could say it like sees the light too soon. And so it turns around and goes back, right? Mm-hmm. Back into back into death, right? There's almost something that seems to me to be here uh, about, about kind of the dangers of, you could call it like the danger of premature enlightenment or the danger of unearned wisdom, right? Um, in a way, it's almost related to like, you know, the parable of the sower goes out to sow the seed. And mm-hmm. some of the some of the seed falls on rocky ground and it springs up really quick. And then the sun comes out and it withers and dies because it 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 had sprung up so fast in the shallow earth that it mm-hmm. wasn't able to put any roots down. Hmm. Um and so uh well, or what about I'm surprised that you see it that way. Like I would tend to see it as something like the the light casts a shadow, right? Right. And so you have this sense that when when light arrives, it both reveals the light, but it also reveals the darkness. So that's yeah. why Simeon says, this is for the rise and fall of many, right, in, in Israel. Right. So the badger, the, the the badger comes out, and the question is, which way is it going to go? Is it going to go towards the light or is it going to go towards the darkness? So if it sees the darkness, then it goes back into darkness. And if it yeah. sees the light, then it comes out into the light. So you could see the the, the moment of revelation yeah. as a kind of it's always like a double revelation, which is why that's how Christ presents it as as a you know as exactly what Simeon says, like as as something which reveals both the glory and the scandal. Yeah, right. All things will be revealed, and so you actually see the sins of everybody, and you also see the the goodness in the world. So and that seems think, to be something like that, which is that at least that, that would, that would yeah. be the way I would interpret it. No, I think you're right. And I, I don't see this. Let me try to reframe what I'm saying a little All bit. Right. right. Because um, you could say there's a, right. So man is microcosm, right? That's the most important medieval idea, right? If you want to understand anything about how they thought about the world in the middle ages or medieval literature, you got to be able to understand what does it mean for man to be a microcosm of, of the, of the cosmos, right? Like a little cosmos. So, on a cosmic scale, the ultimate day of revelation is the last judgment, right? Mm-hmm. When, when you know the fire of God, the light of God reveals light and darkness. But then also in some kind of a in some kind of a way, in like a participatory way, that day is Pascha, 
right? Mm -hmm. Right. That's the day when we say, let God arise and let his enemies be scattered, right? That's the day of his uprising. That's the day when he scatters the enemies of God uh, and he invites he invites those are, who are his, right, into the light, right? And then on a personal level, you could say that that moment, this is what St. Maximus the Confessor says. He says that the, the moment of the dismissal of the catechumens in the divine liturgy corresponds to, participates in the moment of the last judgment. Mm -hmm. so, so that's the moment where you, you, you sort of cast out, you send out the people who are not ready for the light, yeah. Right? And then those that are, now they get to come receive it. How do they receive it is in the Eucharist, which is kind of what this, this feast, the mystery of this feast is about. Mm. That's an and interesting so, idea. Like it's also, it seems related also to the idea of Adam and Eve. Cause you could also, yes. you could see it that way. Like yes. Adam and Eve, they eat the, 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 tr the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Yeah. And then they move, let's say towards the tree of life and that light exposes yeah. their shadow in their case like they see yeah. their shadow they they're they're ashamed of that which is reveals you could say yeah uh, and then they turn back into their hole and try to hide themselves so yeah that's that's exactly it like that's that's exactly it so i i kind of see those things like i don't think i don't think these takes are like contradictory no they're because, not no, you're right yeah um because you could say it's something like it's something like trying to take communion too soon. Like if you were a catechumen and you went up and you you tried to take communion, like it would be to your judgment, right? It'd be to your judgment. Um, you I've know, seen like, priests say like I'm not like if a non orthodox person comes up, he says, "Yeah, I'm not going to give you communion, not because of me, because yeah. of you. I want to yeah. protect you from the right. fire, basically." Right. Yeah. So this is also, I think, very closely associated with the idea of Lent. So the way to kind of think about Lent, right, is, you know, because we start Lent literally with the last judgment, right? Yeah. You know, that's, that's you know, meet fair Sunday, right? It's a Sunday of the last judgment. So we begin Lent actually with the last judgment. So it's, it's exposing here's who you are and here's who you aren't, right? And for most of us, that's just not a great experience. Like most of us, if we're really honest with ourselves and we listen to the gospel on the Sunday of the last judgment, and we start to say, well, I haven't fed Christ. I haven't clothed him. I haven't visited him in prison, mm -hmm. you know, et cetera. Right. So then what do you do? You go back, you kind of go back into death. Right. And so your life becomes more austere. The church services become uh, more uh, solemn and even, you know, darker. Like you see the six weeks of the, of the, the badger or the, the marmot as Lent basically. So, so nice. it's six weeks long. Okay. So in Groundhog Day, the film, right? I've often heard people basically say the movie is about purgatory. Yeah. Right? Which is not wrong, but it's or not Lent. exactly yeah, right Yeah, it's the same. Either. It's similar. Yeah. Yeah. So here's what's interesting. Um, there have been a lot of film theories. You can go out there and find how many days did he do? Like how many times did you do Groundhog Day? Right. Over and over again. You can find like how many times, you know. And some people say, well, to, to learn all the information that he learned, it had to have been like 10,000 years or something, you know, something insane. Okay. Yeah. Taking that stuff aside, the original script in the notes, the director had it be like a thousand years. But in the final script, the one that actually got filmed in, in, the, in the director's notes for the film, he has it as a 40 day period. Nice. So it's 40 days of what? Of basically learning how to repent. Yeah. Right. That's what Groundhog Day is. It's 40 days of learning how to repent, not repentance as just saying, oh, I'm sorry, my bad. Right. That's not repentance. What is repentance? It's it's turning around. It's a change of mind. It's a change of heart. And that's basically what Phil in that movie, who is the groundhog, right? Yeah. He is the groundhog. Right. In fact, at one point, he he kidnaps the actual groundhog and like they drive off a cliff together. Cause he's yeah. just like, wants to end all of this. Right. But what is he doing? He's going back down into the earth. Yeah. He's going his, back he, down he's going into back death into death cave, right? with the groundhog. Right. Yeah. And so for Phil, that's what, like, yeah, that's what happens when he wakes up in the morning and the yeah. day is repeated. It's that yeah. the groundhog hasn't, hasn't moved on. The groundhog has gone back into his cave and right. going to stay in that cave until the sun the sun is really ready he's ready to see the sun like you said yeah yeah and so it's and so when he's able to actually see the light 
and not be scared by his own shadow, right? Mm. And you know, you could go a whole direction with just talking about the shadow, right? But when he's when he's not able when he's able to not be terrified by his own shadow, in other words, his sin, right? This this false personality, it's not really true to himself. Mm. You know, it's just like the armor that he's built up against the world around him. That's when he's able to enter into this loving relationship. And that's what that's Pasca, right? That's what breaks the the, the spell. That's when he gets out, right? Nice. So anyway. I think that's that, amazing. Yeah. I, 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 it's so, once we see it, it's actually so obvious. Right. There's yeah. a relationship between, between all these things. Yeah. But I never have thought about Groundhog Day ever in my life, even though I enjoyed the movie, but I didn't, I watched it so long ago that I wasn't thinking about symbolism at that, at that time. So I didn't yeah. think about how it could be related to, 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 uh, to, to Lent and to Pascha and to the idea of, you know, like, con, let's say, uh, Pur- purging your your passions in order to be ready to uh, to emerge. Let's say yeah. that's wonderful. Yeah. So that's that's all that's I have. Groundhog Day. Yeah. That's so guys, Day. this is great stuff. Yeah. So this is a like I said. I, I hope that people understand. Uh, maybe it's just as the last thing. I hope people sort of can start to see the connection between this and the broader idea of universal history. Right? Is that you have to think of history as being in, you could think of it as like a series of fractals or wheels within wheels or however you want to talk about it, right? Of you've got, here's the story of history, right? Um, this is this is what uh, Vodoloskin in, in like Laris, right? Gets this so beautifully, right? He, he understands this so well. It, is history is not a, it's not just a line, right? It's not a complete circle. It's more like a spiral, right? Yeah. But the way that you live that spiral out is in the cycle of the Christian year, right? Mm as you're moving towards the end of history and people get hung up about, okay, well, when is that? When is the end of history? Well, the short answer, this is also in Loris. Okay. The short answer is the end of history is when you die. Mm, right. Yeah. Like, don't, don't worry about like, when is, you know, the, the, the last judgment or the rapture, like, don't worry about whenever that is supposed to happen. The thing that you know is going to happen is that you're going to die. Yeah. Right. And for you, that is, that is the last judgment. Right. Exactly. And so, um, yeah. So, to, to understand the way that you actually participate in that cycle, in that spiral, you could say, is by attaching yourself to the Christian year, uh, which has left many little remnants, like little ruins in the world around us today. Things like Groundhog Day, right? Mm. Well, when Groundhog, when Groundhog Day comes around this year, instead of saying, oh, what a stupid thing. I guess, I guess we have six more weeks of winter because a rodent in the ground in Pennsylvania says we do. You know, go to church, get a holy candle, light it, keep out the darkness, right? And wait for the light of Pascha. Well, thanks for that. You know, this is great. And so don't worry, everybody. We will we will be back with uh, more universal history. We're gonna we're gonna go back into some Arthur and uh, move on to the millions of things we we could talk about in terms of universal history. So Richard, thanks again. This was really a, this was a sort of nice surprise for me. And uh, thanks, everybody, for paying attention, and we'll talk to you very soon. Hey, Symbolic World gang. Um, I just wanted to take a quick moment to tack on to this video about universal history and the symbolism of Groundhog Day uh, to actually mention to you something that's going to be happening in the North Texas area. So if you are able to get yourself down there uh, towards the end of the month of February 2022, we are hosting an Orthodox Arts Festival. Um, so this is the Festival of Orthodox Christian Art. It's being hosted by St. Constantine and Helen Antiochian Orthodox Church in Carrollton, Texas. Uh, so it's the north part of Dallas. It's February the 18th through the 20th. Check out orthodoxartsfestivaldfw.com. We'll put a link in the description of this YouTube video. Again, that's orthodoxartsfestivaldfw.com and you can get all the information that you need to have about how to get tickets uh, and what the schedule is going to be. We've got a ton of great speakers. Um, we've got a keynote address on the role of the arts in Orthodox theology by Peter Butinoff. Currently, he teaches theology, spirituality, and the arts at St. Vladimir's Orthodox Seminary. He just actually finished co-editing an amazing book on uh, Arvo Part. Um, And he also has a podcast called Luminous Conversations on Sacred Arts, uh, which has all kinds of stuff, uh, all kinds of really, really interesting stuff you guys would enjoy. 
They're also on Saturday, there's going to be presentations, workshops, and demonstrations by local Orthodox artists and also people who like to talk about these things like me. I'm going to be giving a talk on literature and the sacramental imagination. There's going to be a bunch of other really great people there, including some symbolic world folks. Josh Sturgill from the Eighth Day Institute, he'll be there, he'll be talking. Uh, Deacon Anthony Stokes, going to be talking about beauty in the liturgy, the role of quality music in our worship and some other great talks on writing, on architecture in the Orthodox tradition, on reading, on how to actually like look at and study icons. It's gonna be a lot of great stuff. There's gonna be, there are gonna be some films that will be shown there as well, and some workshops, some hands-on stuff and dem demonstrations. Um, and that will all end with Pan-Orthodox Vespers at 5 p.m. on Saturday. So. Anyway, it's gonna be a great event and I look forward to seeing you there. Uh, if you're looking for me, I'm the tall Orthodox guy with a beard.